Hello and welcome to our webcast on the use of real-time sensor data, open source time series database, and analytics software to achieve improved operations and reduced energy consumption. Brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Influx Data. Today we'll be joined by veteran industrial IT consultant Bastian Mauser of NetsConnect. I'm Mark Hosky, an editor with Control Engineering Man Magazine and CFE Media and Technology. In today's webinar, we'll learn how Nidamir Company, an almost 220-year-old industrial printing firm, made its real-time closed-loop processes visible to all interested parties within the enterprise. By collecting data from individual sensors, users were able to configure dashboards that could be shared across an organization. And now a little bit about the mechanics of the webcast. To get the best results from the webcast platform, please make use of the following as you participate in today's event. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, then please refresh the browser or collect, uh, click on the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. If you need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions area. During the presentation, you can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen to type questions for the live Q&A at the end. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation and we'll get to as many as the time allows. To download the presentation slides and certificate of completion, use the event resources box on the left side of your screen. You can download the presentation and certificate of completion until the conclusion of the webcast. The link will break when the webcast signs off. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll send you an email message within a week with a direct link to the webcast archive. So in this webinar, uh, we'll learn how a longtime IT uh, consultant, um, Bastian Mauser, helps his uh, customers make the leap into providing visibility of their uh, processes to everyone in the plant. This journey led to the discovery of untapped opportunity to improve operations, reduce energy consumption, and minimize plant downtime. The collection of data from individual sensors has led to a powerful Grafana dashboard shared across the organization. And now, uh, Bastian Mauser with Nets Consult, please. Hello, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm pleased to share my experience <clears throat> I made within the past, let's say it was nine months, um, implementing um, this visibility approach uh, at my customer. Um, first, um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the situation we have in general in industrial, in manufacturer companies. You buy um, a machine or a, a set of machines you want to make a product with and on the one end you throw in manpower, consumables and energy. This all goes into a black box and hopefully on the other end you get a product that uh, you can sell for more money than you have put in before. What happens in this, in this black box is often not very visible or uh, in maximum opaque. So um, I have one customer, which is a printing company. I will say a few words about it. Uh, it's a Franz Anton Niedermeyer group from uh, Regensburg in Germany. It's in the south of uh, Germany. It's an owner-operated company um, in the sixth generation, roughly 205 employees. And it's not just the printing company, but it's also a creative department. Uh, and they host IT and data center services uh, as well. Um, the technical origin and this is how I slipped into the project was that for the IT department, also the, 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 um, the chief of the company saw our nice dashboards and the visibility approach, which is quite common those days in IT, and asked, um, why don't we apply this or try to make use of this in the traditional or in our industrial 
process because there were problems, there were um, yeah, controlling issues that needed to be addressed with the plant growing. So my, um, I already had the experience uh, through open source projects. We had done it plenty of times in the IT monitoring and um, we defined the target for us when applying this to the industrial process. We wanted to have a better controlling. We wanted to have an instrument for prediction of events. We wanted to save dollars and we wanted to escape a vendor lock. Um, we had relatively quick first results uh, after implementing some in the first uh, step, there were pretty dirty scripts. We had uh, graphs, we had data coming in and we had the first uh, visualization. Um, as well, we noticed that most of the work was not just implementing the interfaces to the different subsystems, but it was more interpreting and validating the numbers. So to find out, is it a raw value I get from a specific data emitter in the plant, or is it already pre-calculated? Um, this was a high amount of, of labor. Um, some words about print for, for those who, who are not common with it or familiar with it. Um, we, we are a high volume offset uh, printing company. We have three big high volume machines um, manufactured by uh, Emma and Roland. Uh, Goss, it's um, a company from Germany. Um, two uh, 96 page machines to a 180 page machine. Um, they have an output of about 4.8 million A4 pages per hour, and they run usually in 24-7 in, uh, production. Now this, this plant or one machine doesn't, uh, isn't delivered as one piece. You uh, have several subunits which come from different, uh, different vendors. From the front to the back, you have the splicer, you have the inking units, you have the dryer, the remoistener unit, you have wet cutters, you have the folding unit you have a conveyor belt system, you need the trimmers, the stackers, the strappers, a pelletizer and a robot, and finally a foliator to get your product on a, on a pallet. Um, to give you an idea of how the plant looks like, here we have um, an image, just an aerial image of the scale of the plant. It's just, uh, it has grown over the past two or three years. Um, to this to this state, and this is a current uh, picture. Something from the inside, just to give you a brief idea um, how how the system and how the machinery looks from the inside. This is a folding tower uh, on the on the top. Next to that, there you see the conveyor belts, um, and the, these units are all coming from different vendors, and this brings a dilemma with it. The the fact that we have an array of different units or different vendors gives a notoriously high heterogeneity of the data sources and the access protocols throughout the subunits. The interfaces between those units are often reduced to what is required to get the machine running, um, but that's it. It's often only an electrical signal and not much data passing through. You have um, a manual or semi-automated reporting or aggregation of the data units, this isn't delivered. And if you want to do it, you have to make it manually. Uh, and this is um, often a question of high amounts uh, of, of labor and it's prone to errors. So in, in practice, the technical director sits down two times a year, collects the data from all the emitters that may be PDFs, that may be uh, web pages from, from the controlling servers per unit. That may be um, that may be um, a Java application which is running uh, on the workstation and manually collecting the results and the metrics from the job, putting it into an Excel sheet, and this doesn't really scale. Um, this is a frustrating thing. Another thing is that often the data is only available when a complete job has been run, and often the problem that occurred during production or the things have already gone wrong. Usually you want to have the data um, when it happens and not when it already has gone wrong. And um, this was the main reason to, to try to achieve a visibility approach 
uh, like we do it in IT, to have all metric live. So in our case, what data sources do matter? We have the whole plan con or the main plan control. It's called PCOM PMI. We have access to this with an ODBC interface. It's a, a Postgres SQL database. Um, meanwhile, we have the, the color control, the, the IDC. Uh, we get the data. Uh, we are an MQTT broker. We have uh, on the 80 page machine the same IDC from another vendor. This is Quadtech. We get it on an MQTT broker as well. Um, but we also want to have the data of the surrounding units. This is, for instance, energy. We use a lot of energy there. And uh, there we have an energy management system uh, called uh, GridWiz, uh, and the sensors are uh, supplied by Yanitsa. Uh, this whole system provides a REST API, which we conveniently use and, and query to get live data from, from, for all energy consumption. We also want to have data from our ERP system. We want to know who is working on, uh, on a machine, what job was planned on a machine, and what calculations have been done for a specific job to have or to deploy some kind of real-time business number validation. We want to have data from the robot cells because um, we want to know better about waste causes, not just in the primary machine within the printing process, but also in the post-processing because waste can happen there as well. Um, and some more details or technical specific stuff is we have a fluid management within uh, the machine, which cares for remoistening the web. And uh, we want to have um, uh, wear sensors for, for sleeves and for, for, our, for the liquidation, uh, liquidifying system to tell when things wear out in advance. And finally, we have our central ink supply system, which uh, is provided by Technotrans. Um, we want to know how much ink we have drawn from the silos and how much has been pumped uh, to, the, to the inking units. So the possible approaches to solve, to solve the problem with, the, with our data mess. We could go on and, uh, and use our Excel sheet of death. We don't want to do it anymore. It doesn't really scale. Uh, we've been there. It doesn't work. We can use an RRD collector. That's how, um, how it worked in IT, let's say, 10 years ago. Mm, it doesn't really scale well with the amount of data we intended to collect. We could also, or one idea was to, to make um, a custom tailored application with a table relational structure behind it. But this would require manual uh, adjustment if we get, or if something in subunit change, if we get another machine, we, again, we have to go and set the programmers there and expand it. Nah, but this wasn't really um, the best idea. The elastic stack, uh, many people are talking about it, but it's more aimed at, uh, at textual metrics like log information that comes from servers, but we are more dealing with uh, numeric um, metrics and numeric measurement values. So this doesn't really suit our needs. So the final and the best um, solutions seem to be graphite um, with carbon and whisper as storage engine and Grafana for the visualization for making graphs or the tick stack, uh, which means telegraph, InfluxDB, chronograph, capacitor, and Grafana. Uh, this had the nice uh, option that we can, uh, we now have the possibility to do uh, one-click uh, machine learning to, to, to learn ML models um, within a GUI, which is provided by LoudML. It's a, um, it's a fork of, uh, of chronograph, which is part of the tick stack provided by InfluxDB. Finally, we decided for the tick stack. Uh, this, there were several reasons for, the, for going for this. Um, the first was that it scales well at high interest rates. We don't have mega high interest rates like in very big IT deployments, but we still run about 800 data points per unit or per machine per second. That goes about 2,000 to 2,500 data points for the whole plant. So we won't have a prob problem with it. We have a compelling storage engine concept in terms of speed and of space efficiency. The compression algorithm uh, of InfluxDB, um, yeah, it works really great. Um, it does its job very well, and we are totally um, 
okay with that. And we have solved the problem of space reclaim, which is often an issue in SQL databases. When you do housekeeping, you have data like, let's say, five years old. You don't want to have it anymore. You delete the records, but you don't reclaim the disk space. These are all problems um, that InfluxDB, the time series database, addresses. You have an extensive eco ecosystem of plugin for input and for output. So due to the fact that we got to deal with a heterogeneous environment and need to adapt to the different systems, we have Telegraph as, let's say, some kind of Swiss army knife. You can connect to a REST API with it. You can provide a REST API with it to tell other units to report to it. You can connect to an MQTT broker, get data from there. You can connect to an ODBC database, get data from there. And this comes in very handy and it works, it plays really, really well uh, with InfluxDB. And finally, Influx is proven uh, production ready. Meanwhile, another, uh, a, a good number of, of uh, big IT companies uh, rely on it. Um, it's Tesla, it's PayPal, you name it. There are many, many uh, companies that work in much higher scales with it. So, um, we can we can trust it that it won't uh, we, we won't see any worse or any bad box um, we didn't um, have in mind so this was important for us as well um, for uh, getting the data into this ecosystem and dealing with the different data sources we used as well node red to feed the data in this has the advantage that we um, we can define some standard for for applying um, data in just formats for the different machines and adapt nearly every thinkable data source we can we can only imagine. Let's see this example for instance our um, our PCS system the the PCOM system. We have a Node-RED module for ODBC, then we make an, uh, a flow, an ODBC flow for it, and pipe this to MQTT, this goes to Telegraph, and we have it in InfluxDB. This is really painless. The same goes for our energy system. We can ask an HTTP AP, API, um, so we design a flow for Node-RED for it, and this transforms it into our standard MQTT format, which we can consume to InfluxDB. Uh, the same goes with our ERP system. We can have a connector to Oracle. Our ERP system is a traditional client-server uh, application, and we can pull the data out of it we need and just transform it in a way uh, it's, it suits our, um, our standards for visualization on the, on the right side, on the visualization and analytics side. Um, as well, we have uh, the possibility to feed the live data or streaming metrics from data sources that support it. Uh, currently, it is uh, our IDC. It's the color control system. We can we get live measurements from it. Um, we use this to derive quality KPIs, and we get live data from uh, from our robot cells with OPC UA. Um, and the OPC OA protocol, there is an, an open source project where you can build a bridge between MQTT and OPC OA. Uh, so we have an easy time feeding that data through uh, Node-RED into MQTT and finally to our InfluxDB. On the right side, you see uh, what we are doing with the data. On the one end, of course, we have the visualization. We use Grafana for it to have nice dashboards, to have the, the public dashboards which are used at the machines to have the controlling dashboards which are used by the, con by, the, by the directors of the company to make some business number validation, to make a controlling for personal and stuff. And um, this is all done with Grafana. This works pretty well. There's a huge ecosystem of different panels and it comes with nearly everything you need um, um, on stock. For data exploration, for instance, if we have a new subunit and we need to validate some data and see how we need to handle or calculate data, we usually use Chronograph. This is the visualization platform that, come, that comes with InfluxDB. <clears throat> and this, we use this mainly for, for doing some data science on what we have collected. Finally, we have Capacitor. This also ships with InfluxDB. We can use this or we use this to to raise alerts or events on 
on, on uh, developments within the data. So we can set thresholds or we can set dependencies that inform us about um, if the plant is running in a state it maybe shouldn't be running, mainly for energy savings. For instance, we want to know if we don't have a plant job and if we uh, don't produce since two hours, why are unit A, B and C running? So um, we can save energy and make people aware that maybe things are running that shouldn't be running. Um, the node red flow design looks like this. This is an example on how we get the IDC data uh, into it. On the left side, you see our MQTT consumer. We get the raw data as a JSON object from the MQTT broker. And um, then we have some JavaScript functions. Or first, we convert it into an object, from JSON into an object. And then we have a, um, a JavaScript function where we can transform it into that standard we defined for having the data in InfluxDB. And finally, we publish it again on, an, on another MQTT topic where Influx consumes it from. Steps we had to take um, for the whole project. It was, the first thing is, was that we needed to define or to be identify the data sources that matter, that are really important for us in the first step. And to see, do we have the instrumentation? We need to read out data and where do we extend the instrumentation? There were a few points in the energy supply system where we didn't have a, a sufficient instrumentation, so we had to add sensors to the distribution units. We had to think about the technical interface design. So um, how do we pull the data off? Some stuff worked with plain telegraph. For instance, when we have a REST API, we can configure telegraph to to pull the data off it and directly fit it into, uh, feed it into InfluxDB. Some uh, systems require moderate coding. So uh, we had to do a little bit of uh, moderate reverse engineering and build in our own interface, but this usually isn't such a big deal. And it always depends a little bit on how much documentation you have of the system and if your vendor is willing to help you with it. And then you have the dashboard design. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's nearly all done. Uh, what you see is what you get. Um, you have a dashboard designer in Grafana and choose the graph type you want, choose the data source you want. You uh, can model the, if you want to have some prediction on it with it. This is quite easy. Um, as, uh, another skill or another step we had to take is was what uh, are the KPIs for it? What key performance indexes are important for us? And uh, we have the performance indexes in terms of speed and uh, production performance, and we have the performance index in terms of quality. So this was this involved a lot of talks with the uh, with the um, uh, print stuff with the technical uh, director who has all the knowledge uh, regarding the print process. This is a pretty interdisciplinary thing. Um, finally, uh, since we had the data acquisition step taken and the visualization step taken, we needed or we, we thought it would be helpful to, to define alerts um, for various reasons. For instance, I want to have an alert if some quality KPI is running, um, is running out of sight or is uh, going beyond a specific threshold. I want to have an alert if systems which shouldn't be running, defined by, the, by what we get from the ERP systems are running. Maybe someone has just forgotten to turn off a unit. And um, yeah, so we sat together and defined uh, a list of alerts for it. The difficulties we ran over uh, in the process was that mm, sometimes a little bit of reverse engineering is required because you don't get enough input from the vendor of the machine or um, there is no documentation, not always, um, in, especially in industry uh, machinery. Um, those are machine builders and often not so IT, um, IT stuff. They don't have uh, so much IT stuff and can answer the questions even if they would like. So sometimes it's faster that you reverse engineer it but to, uh, uh, than to wait for, for a documentation which maybe doesn't even exist. Uh, you often have to deal with outdated hardware. That was my uh, experience. 
Sometimes you have a Windows XP system still somewhere in the whole, in some island network within within the process or within the plant. And so dealing with outdated hardware and software is not uncommon. Negotiations with the machine suppliers can be challenging sometimes because maybe they want to sell their own um, analytic system or they also have an idea with it regarding this topic of, of metrics and visualization or visibility. Um, and mm, so they need to be convinced that it's a good idea to give you an open interface to their data. Uh, finally, we work this out with the most in, or with the uh, with all um, vendors we have there or with all machine suppliers we have there. So um, in the end, everything was good. Finally, data validation. Sometimes from different uh, data emitters, you get the same value or you think it's the same value, like for instance, the, the ink uh, consumption or the gas consumption, but you get different measurements. And so you have to find out why do you get different measurements? Um, is there a technical problem? So uh, maybe um, impulses aren't transmitted or are missing from one unit to the, to the other, or is there already a formula applied on on one of the units, this is something you have to find out and this takes time because you have to talk to many people, you have to dig into the plant and see how the wiring works and uh, how the software works internally and this can be time consuming. Good habits um, that we learned are that you should implement security right away when you start it. So, for instance, if you uh, deploy an MQTT broker for collecting metrics, um, enable authentication uh, in advance. Even better, um, deploy TLS client certificates in advance because once you get it in production, it's always a hassle to, uh, to do it afterwards. Put all sensors and all instrumentation to deploy in a separate VLAN. So you have everything you got you need for, for gathering metrics in a separate VLAN um, without a connection to the rest of the network because it's always a security relevant uh, topic. Collecting every data that you can get from every system isn't a very good idea as well because you will find yourself uh, drowned in a sea of data uh, and often you have so much redundancies within it you cannot really handle that well. It's the better approach to have an idea before um, you get a list of data for what, what you can get and then you should pick I need this metric and this metric and this metric and start recording that instead of recording everything. Um, at least for me it turned out to be the, the handier method. Um, avoid redundancy of values unless there's a reason. So if you get the, the gas consumption from one unit, always try to get it from the first unit. And for instance, if you from your if you got the value from your energy uh, supplier, take that value and don't take the value the machine derives from it because there's just one step in between which is prone to errors. You should avoid that. Um, do an interpretation documentation. So. Once um, you make a visualization for a value because you have validated it and you know that this is a correct value, write down um, where those values originate from and if it's a raw value and what calculations you do on it or what calculations are already done on the data emitter side. Um, this comes in handy if you want to work on it with several people or if someone else uh, is uh, supposed to extend uh, the instrumentation or the monitoring system later on, um, documentation is not a bad idea uh, here as well. And don't end up in having a directory full of custom scripts. I've been there. Um, um, it's, uh, it doesn't come handy to have a directory with 15 Python scripts, uh, which all work a little bit different. It's the better approach to to define your own standards and, for instance, put it in uh, put it in Node-RED, so you have it a, a bit more visual and other people can work with it. So let's uh, get to the results and to the to the um, 
to the metrics that interested us, uh, interested us most in the print company. For the first, we have electrical power. We have a high, uh, high values or high amounts of electrical power we consume. It's about four megawatts for the plant. And um, especially in Germany, electrical power is relatively expensive and we made the biggest savings here. Uh, we get paper. Uh, we consume about 100,000 metric tons per year of paper. So um, it's crucial for us to, to quantify the waste and to have a fine granularity uh, in the quantification. You want to identify the waste causes. Where did the waste happen? Because from front to back, there are several things that can go wrong and where waste can occur. And you want to know it in detail. Um, the next project which is currently running is that we want to reduce the waste by reducing the washing cycles to it is normal in the industry to, to have fixed washing cycles to print two, wheel, two reels and then have a washing cycle and then print one reel and then have a washing cycle. But uh, practice has shown that depending on the, on the color and on the print product and on the web width, you can sometimes print more than two reels without having a print quality or a color uh, control quality issue. Um, so we want to make the measurements or we want to take the measurements to steer the washing cycles. This can save for more waste as well. And another thing is that from the metrics we, we uh, collect and from the visualization we, we have, we want to be able to predict uh, situations to, uh, to do, uh, avoid an unplanned downtime. We can do this by uh, analyzing, for instance, uh, metrics that come from drives, from motors, or from conveyor belt drives uh, that show um, that show an abnormal behavior. Um, so we can order spare parts in advance to reduce downtime. This is something that uh, has uh, happened as well, and um, which was a big success. And finally, we have a big um, ink supply. We use lots of ink, like. Uh, 2,700 metric tons uh, per year. We want to validate the consumption. We want to uh, forecast um, the consumption to, to better plan deliveries, when to, uh, when to order new ink. And this has shown some interesting things uh, as well that has shown that, for, for instance, what the, the, the measurement system that comes with a press or uh, from Manroland it doesn't really reflect the truth. Well, it turned out that that the measurement um, is prone to mechanic, or the measurement unit is prone to mechanical degradation. And on the oldest machine, the values are partially 20 to 25 percent off. Uh, that explained why we were missing some 100 tons of ink which we bought, but which wasn't counted. Um, this just only became visible uh, through our monitoring system. Okay, and let's look at the dashboard that comes out of, um, of this whole project. This is a tactical overview. We see uh, the most important print, printing machines we have in here. We see the performance, the speed the machine is currently running on. We see we have this, um, this blue background so we can see the, uh, what has happened the last six hours and we can see or the director can see if they have any unplanned downtimes or how, how efficient or how, how available the machine was. Below that we have uh, quality KPIs, it's, uh, we call it delta E, on the paper. So we can immediately see the paper quality in an unprinted state. And below that we have our KPIs for, for, um, for color matching, for color quality. So we have a, a quick overview how well we have been doing in terms of print quality within the given time period. Um, this is helpful as well. This is a little bit more uh, detailed. There is uh, one parameter within uh, the print that is called dot gain that defines how big a printed dot in the offset printing grows when the color goes to the paper. Um, this process has to be, um, or the, these values play a vital role in print plate production. And here we can see how well the print plate has been produced and has been uh, copied for the paper we use and for the ink we use and for the whole print product we are 
currently producing here. Uh, we have more detailed um, instrumentation for, for quality control. Here we can see in which, um, which of the colors are matching how well into the standard. When, when a print job is defined or is being set up for the machine, do you, you define a standard on which standard you want to print. That depends on the paper you use. That depends on the color you use. And um, here you can see how well we are within the de desired um, color space on the upside and, the, and, and on the downside of the, of the web width. Um, uh, the, um, the red area on top uh, says, okay, with that color of CMY, it's always CMYK, with those colors you were out of the standard or you have a problem there and everything below the red area is fine. So we see here in that case, we didn't do very well. On the next slide, we have some KPI or some, some performance overview regarding waste. So we can see um, um, the, the job which was in, it is blurred for data protection reasons, but uh, the, the upper bar shows which, which job or which order we were processing. And on the lower, uh, on the graph, we see how the waste um, compared to the complete job has developed over time. Of course, the waste percentage uh, goes uh, or um, shrinks when we are printing more because waste, waste occurs most in the beginning of the job. More interesting metrics uh, in print. Here, for instance, we see um, a, diverse, a, a more diverse view on waste because we can have waste from washing. We can have, wa uh, we can have waste in the post-processing if something in the stacker or in the palletizer isn't working. Um, and we have a good overview here what causes our waste. And we can see if maybe we have mechanical problems in the post-processing. Um, and the lower bar, for instance, shows our uh, real numbers. So we can see what real has been in the machine and has there been any real which has been causing many issues uh, like web cuts, for instance, this is when, when the paper, when the paper web or the, 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 when it cuts and the whole machine needs to stop for it. We have a deep analysis dashboard as well. We have uh, something blurred out, but you can uh, see where this goes. We have, um, a good overview uh, in the top over the uh, machine performance. It's uh, revolutions per hour versus energy consumption. Uh, below that, we see who was working on the machine. Below that, we see um, which job was in the machine. And below that, we see which job was planned according to the ERP system. So we can validate does that what we have in the ERP system match with what we have in the machine as well. We have some more deep analysis for business number validation. So we pull um, prices for consumables from the ERP system and see what our sensors have detected, what, how many amounts we have consumed. And so here we can see, okay, for the last two days, we have consumed ink for a specific amount of kilograms. We can directly translate the ink type to, to, uh, to a number in terms of euros. Um, we see how many outages we had. In this uh, example, it was 58 minutes uh, downtime and how much, were, uh, the, uh, how much damage it did uh, financially. We see how much electrical power we consumed, nearly 30 megawatt hours, how much money this meant, meant for us, how much gas was consumed, and which types of, uh, of waste we produced and how much good products, or yeah, we call it the goods, uh, we were able to, to produce. Um, the achievements we got so far, uh, where are we? We have production real-time data. Uh, some are near real-time, that is all the data we pull, and we get some streaming metrics, which I personally prefer. That means the, the, the unit emits the data and streams it when it happens. This is the best case you can have, but we don't have it everywhere. But there we have it near real time. We pull it each 10 to 30 seconds. You always have to look a little bit to not cause too much load. For instance, if you have a database server somewhere, you don't want to query it every second and uh, cause massive load on it. This is something you need to keep in mind. 
we made uh, significant energy savings by defining alerts. The story is that the people said, okay, we let the dryer run. We, we have a 36 hour maintenance window over the weekend. It's 24 to 36 hours, depending on the workload. And um, for years they have said, okay, we keep the dryer running. It only costs a few hundred euros of gas. Yeah, that's true. It only costs a few hundred euros of gas. But um, the cooling tower is running as well, and the cooling tower needs some whopping 300, 300 to 350 kilowatts, and that makes some thousand euros per weekend per machine. And this sums up to a, to a decent uh, six-digit number per year. We have very fine-grained values, and we can we can zoom into them um, interactively, even weeks later or months later, or if we need it, years later. This is uh, helpful when we want to assess problems we had months ago or a time ago on uh, on a machine, or if we need to print a job again, which we have printed, let's say, a year ago, and we had issues with it, we can look into it and maybe make things better or make adjustments for printing this specific job again and uh, to make the conclusions or to draw the conclusions from it. We have, uh, which is for me one of the most interesting things, LoudML with TensorFlow as a machine learning um, um, analytics in place. Um, we can do things with it. For it, there are drives uh, for the conveyor belts, for the dryer, for the printing units, and they are always um, subject to wear. Um, some drives you can just put on, on stock because they are small, they don't cost too much, but some drives are really big and you can't put too much of them on stock. And you want, don't want to change them due to a service interruption, you want to change them in the plant outage window. So what we can do is to take the metrics, the motor emits, this is usually the power, the, um, the current, the temperature, the torque, and the fan speed, and from those five values, you can always, or you, you can have a good overview over the health of the motor. And um, this enabled us to forecast or to predict the outage of a drive because we just once had an outage and we looked at the metrics which were, and we noticed there was one current that was about one empire and this developed over weeks. It started to be on average over the day to two, uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 amp too high. And this always went a little bit more. It wasn't too visible until the motor broke due to a bearing fail. <clears throat> we took that, uh, that anomaly, um, made um, ML pattern from it, a machine learning pattern from it with loud ML. And this pattern was redetected. Uh, it was months later. And Indeed, this drive, we were able to, to order a spare part in advance. It failed like six weeks later, and this was a big success because we knew this fail was coming, and we were able to, to reduce the downtime um, by many hours. Um, we have a, now we have the, pol uh, the possibility of a close interval validation of the business numbers. One example was the ink consumption. Um, the validation between what do we need to order or what do we need to calculate for a specific print product per per item or um, was made on assumptions. There was, um, yeah, they said, okay, we will probably need, um, let's say, 300 tons for that job or 20 tons for that job or they had always this, this assumption from their, yeah, not from measured values, but just from, from assumptions. And this doesn't help. Now we have, we can see while the job is running, how much did we really use per, uh, per ton or per uh, thousand uh, copies? Or yeah, you can always say, do we really have the right numbers in our ERP system to, to, to make a profit or to make it proper? And we were finally able to escape the vendor lock-in. A few words about the vendor lock-in. It's not, or some people may think we have uh, just developed a monitoring system now which wasn't in place before. That is not true. The 
Print machines come with some kind of monitoring, but you get 50 monitoring systems. You get one for the printing, for, for the main print plan control, you get one for the splicer, you get one for the dryer, you get one for the post-processing, and this doesn't scale well. What we did now is was to, to free the data out of those islands, I call it, uh, uh, I want to call it now, put it into one bucket and to have one uniform visualization for it, to, to make use of it. Otherwise, the data would not be used because it would be too much, too much work to look at each system every time. In the future, uh, what will we do in the future? We want to deploy more instrumentation. Um, despite the fact or despite the possibility to um, use sensor values from motors and uh, from drives to make predictive um, predictive analysis, there are sensors you can mount mechanically mount on, on bearings and on, on motors to have an even better uh, prediction of failures that might be coming far before it you see it in any metrics that the uh, the, the drives emit um, we want to deploy those you can even say if it's the inner or the outer bearing that is going to fail this is something we want to we want to test um, we are continuing our talks with vendors to get more metrics um, on the MQTT broker, so we don't need to pull them out of uh, of the databases. Um, but we want to get, yeah, we want to get it streamed, and we want to improve, or we want to continue with our idea to to generate signaling from the data we collected back to production. One example was the idea to reduce the washing waste based on IDC data. These dot gain values are changing in a specific way when, when we need to have a washing cycle. And um, we are on a good way to using this data with some anal analytics to generate this signal so we can have a variable washing interval and thereby save much energy, much waste, and CO2 and money in, in the end. Yeah, and that's... Um, where we are currently with our visibility project. And um, yeah, I'm happy that I could tell you a little bit about it. Well, thank you, uh, Bastian. We appreciate it very much. Uh, now we will have a uh, question and answer session uh, with the, uh, some questions coming in from the, the audience. Uh, those listening live can continue to type questions for today's presenter in the Ask a Question box on the screen. Uh, within a few days, the presentation will be available for on-demand viewing, and we'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website, send you an email message with the link connecting directly to it, and to related resources, including a story answering any additional questions that we do not get to in today's questions and answers. And now, uh, on to the questions with uh, Bastian Mauser. Um, in, in your experiences, uh, what areas did you save the most money? You did have some slides on that. Uh, perhaps you could review. Yeah. Um, the most savings were definitely done on electrical power and uh, on pressurized air, where pressurized air is generated by electrical power. Um, by validating the state of the whole plant. Um, you, can have, you can make a rule set, or we were able to make a rule set that says, if we don't have a production plan in the ERP system and the machine isn't running for a given amount of time, let's say two hours or three hours, to compensate for, for overproduction or for delays we may have had for the job before, um, then we can make an active notification to, to the facility management to shut down unit one, two, and three, or to, to shut down specific subunits. Um, the notification currently is done on a, on a Slack channel, or we use Metamos in that case, but technically it's the same, and on email. So the technical director the, and the uh, facility manager gets a notification, and then they can go uh, and turn down um, the units. And this was, uh, like I said, um, uh, 
uh, upper six digit euro amount per year we were able to save. Very impressive. Um, another question concerning the expiration of data uh, collected. Can it be preserved for a, a period of time, perhaps uh, 30 days or more, for instance? Yeah, data um, retention and data preservation is handled by InfluxDB. Uh, In InfluxDB, you uh, define a retention policy that says how long you want to keep the data, and you can also um, make a custom definition if you want to have or if you want to change the granularity of the value. So, you, for instance, you can say all data older than um, than one year. I don't need it in one second um, um, precision. I need it in 10 second precision. And you can reduce the amount of data points um, which are required. In our case, we don't really make use of it until now because the compression is so good and the performance is so great that there was no real need to comp to um, to reduce the amount of data from from older um, yeah, from from let's say one or two years ago. Um, so it, it is possible, but we didn't need to. Uh, another question: uh, What type of computing offers the greatest interest or challenge in terms of integration or data management? Uh, real-time process control or enterprise transactional system? Um, I would say it's uh, the real-time process control. And so uh, data integration in this project was a concern? Um, and what, oh, how do you mean that? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, making sure that you had uh, data flowing to the right systems. You mentioned you were gathering from many different wells, uh, many different databases uh, to collect all information into one. Yeah, um, this is one thing we manage with, uh, with, the, um, with uh, Node-RED. For every data source, we have one separate flow um, that makes sure that the data from this source gets treated um, or gets always treated in the same way. So this wasn't, uh, this is how we solved it. Very good. Um, are, are users installing this type of infrastructure in, in brownfield environments, or is it typically uh, restricted to a greenfield uh, environment or installation? Um, I think um, this is, um, Usually used in brownfield installations because it doesn't come um, it doesn't come with um, with the facility. So it's all, in my experience a thing that is done afterwards. Good. Are, are there any rules of thumb as to what types of applications should be executed at the edge and and what should be done in the cloud? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it always depends a little bit on um, do you really close the loop back to have a signaling into production, then you probably uh, want to have everything on-premise and not um, put it in the cloud because um, if once you're offline, you don't want to have a production interruption if you're offline for some reason. It always depends, of course, how good the internet connection is. If you have a very reliable, redundant internet connection, of course, you can put it in the cloud if you follow or if you implement it safely. Um, we decided here to, uh, to have it on-premise, which works with, well, with InfluxDB because you can install, install it on-premise and everything still works if you are offline. Very good. Um, you, you, the presentation included some information about standards. Please talk about the role of open standards or open computing in the architecture and the infrastructure that you've discussed here today. Yeah, um, this is um, something we, we ran across several times, especially in the machine manufacturing section or uh, area. Many things are done very proper, proprietary. Um, things aren't documented so well. And there are no, uh, for real-time data, they use proprietary protocols. Uh, MQTT 
surprisingly is not so common for for all this it, but some of the vendors didn't even hear from it and so we had to we had to define our own standards on how in what format we want to gather the metrics um, um i was surprised to see that it was a little bit um yeah that we not many manufacturers follow the approach nearly no vendor i talked with and i went to them and said okay i want to have the data uh, i want to have an interface they weren't aware of the fact that people need this um and so we had to define the standards there there, there was no open standard at all the, regarding interfaces, there is OPC UA, of course, which is a technical protocol, how you can access the data. But regarding the data formats, there was no real standard. We had to define it in this case. Thank you. Uh, when handling large data sets for visualization, and you want to display a scatter plot over, say, a million data points, what would be the best visualization approach for, for rendering and uh, interaction to be able to see? Um, we visualize everything within um, within Grafana. Um, it handles excessive amounts of data uh, exceptionally well. Uh, you can uh, interactively work uh, on the graphs. So um, this is all handled within the chosen tick stack. Good. Um, in designing the solution, uh, how did you ensure that working uh, with the subject matter um, experts at, at Nightmare was a, a smooth process. Um, in this specific case, we had good um, good parameters. Um, I know the customer quite a long time. We have a good relation, and this ensured that um, that the idea was brought from the top, and the the, uh, the CEO just said, "Okay, we want to do this," and everyone has to support this this um, this process um, and in addition we had unlimited funding or virtually unlimited funding for adding instrumentation or uh, for paying um, vendors to give us an additional interface and for all this stuff this is not always the case um, in other I had other customers or other cases where I was asked if we can make some industry 4.0 solution or to to um, help them with a visibility approach, but often you come to a company, they have an IT department, and they own, often don't see you, or sometimes they don't see you as a friend because you come with so many new stuff with InfluxDB and Grafana and all this hip new MQTT Internet of Things uh, stuff, especially when it comes to machine builders, they are very conservative there. So, um, a bigger part or a relevant part of the job is uh, more of psychological nature than uh, than of technical nature. This was really a thing that was um, or that is difficult in many cases. In the case of Niedermeyer, the, show, the case I was talking about now, we really had good um, Good parameters from the outside. We had support from the CEO, from the from the uh, CEO. We had unlimited funding, and we could just do it and get whatever we want to make this happen. Very good. Thank you for all your answers, Bastian, and thank you to the audience for the questions. Uh, before we conclude, um, I would like to thank our attendees for uh, attending, uh, for Bastian's expertise and spending time with us during the webinar, and. Um, for more information, uh, we would invite uh, presenters to go to the uh, website uh, for links in, in the presentation. Uh, thank you to Influx Data for sponsoring today's webcast. And now that we're just about finished, uh, we want to hear how we did. The ex exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of uh, our sponsor, uh, Influx Data, and CFE Media and Technology, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, seeing you next time, and thank you for attending.